Well, greetings, family. It's so good to be together. And you can see we're kicking off a new series called Building the House of God. And we are in the middle of a building project. Actually, we are at the end of a building project. It's a little exciting. We've been working together as a family for literally over a year, making massive sacrifices. And in just a few weeks, we're going to go into this new space. There'll be an additional 500 seats on Sunday morning. Here's what I'm also really excited about. Most of this new space is going to be a tool and a resource that we give to our kids and our teenagers. And I think that's pretty amazing. It says a lot about the heart of this church, doesn't it? Sometimes people look at a kid or a teenager, and in a well-meaning way, they'll say, you know what, we need to invest in those kids because they're the church of tomorrow. No, 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 no. They are the church of today, and they can follow Jesus flat out today, and they can lead today, and they are in this church, and this is a massive statement to them that we believe in you, and we trust what God is doing in and through you, and that new space is going to be open in just a few weeks, and because of that, we're going to need a new map, right? Because the current map won't be relevant anymore. And we're gonna need to have new names for the new spaces, right? You can't go, there's like a room down there, dude. It's, uh, or like when new parents come in and say, where do we take our eight-year-old? We can't go, well, like if you go like around the corner, there's a, a, a room up there, so we don't really have a name for it. That doesn't build confidence, right? We're all gonna have to have a new map and we're gonna need new names. And that is the essence of this series. What is the actual map and the right name for the church. If you're a note taker, you can pull out your notes right now and you'll see there's a white space, all right? There's like a box. And there's a picture we're gonna draw today and it is the the entire message in this one picture. So even if you have the drawing skills of an eight-year-old like I do, go ahead and try to draw it. And, And at the bottom of the box, all right, You can write this phrase, okay, be the church. What is the right map, what is the right name in order for us to be the church? You know, we're talking about building the house of God. Jesus said he was in the middle of a building project. These are his words. You'll see them on the screen. Let's read them out loud together, nice and loud. This is what Jesus said together. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus said, I am building my church. What did he have in mind? Well, I've been doing this long enough to say, I think what Jesus had in mind and often what we have in mind in terms of what it means to be the church are different. In fact, I would say to some extent, all of us in this room actually have the wrong map and the wrong name for what it means to be the church. And you know what's kind of funny and tragic? Guess where we learned the wrong definition of church? church. A church! Isn't that interesting? Let me prove it to you. I grew up in the church, and starting in uh, kindergarten, all the way through elementary school, we would begin every Sunday school with a little memory device to teach us what church is. Now, if you grew up in Sunday school, you might know this. If you do, can you do it with me? Come on, I dare you. If you grew up in Sunday school and you know this, let's say it out loud together. We'd start every Sunday with this. Here it is. Here's the church. Here's the steeple. Open the door and here are the people. And I remember as a kid thinking, they're never going to get out of there. (laughs) They're trapped like I am in this Sunday school class. They've been assimilated. Help them, please. Now think about it. It starts out with what? Here's the church. What is this telling us? What is the church? A building, right? Okay, so let's draw the building. Put that in your your box on the left-hand side. Here's the church. Here's the steeple. This is what you could call the go-to church paradigm. Now, I bet last night or this morning, a bunch of us in this room probably said, let's go to church. Hey, remember, we got to go to church, right? And that was right before you had the big argument about getting ready and getting over here, right? Let's go to church. And it feels harmless, doesn't it? It feels like semantics. It feels like, come on, this is a harmless phrase. Does it really matter? Well, let me tell you something. That little phrase, go to church, it's very dense. It carries a lot of freight. In fact, it's a 1,700-year-old definition of what it means to be the church. It started when the bishops shook hands with Constantine. 
and, and the church began to be remade in the image of the empire. And for the first time, churches had buildings. And there began to develop an ecclesiastical structure, almost like a caste system inside the church. And when we say go to church, it feels harmless, but it actually has a very deep definition for what church is. So we're just going to go ahead and look at that. All right, write this down. This is the big idea for the series. Jesus calls us to be the church, not go to church. Jesus calls us to be the church, not just go to church. So what does go to church actually mean? Well, write, write this down. Here's the paradigm. In the go to church paradigm, church is a building where I attend a weekly event and religious programs. Church is a building where I attend a weekly event and a religious program. So let's just make a little contrast and comparison list, okay? First of all, here's the church, here's the steeple. The church is a building. And what happens at that, that building? Well, it's a place we go to attend. And what do we attend? A weekly event. You know, it's about an hour long, and a preacher preaches, and we sing songs together. And also, if it's a really good church, they're going to have other programs, right? They're going to have kids' programs, and student programs, and men, men's programs, and women's programs. I mean, I grew up in a church that measured your spirituality and your commitment by how many programs you attended every single week. Now, Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. But my church thought he said, I have come that we might have meetings and have them to the full. And if you went once a week, it was like, ah, uh, you're a wuss, you know. Twice a week, it was like fair in the middle. And three times a week, now you're serious. Did anyone else grow up in this church? You know what I'm talking about? You, rented your, you rated your spirituality. How many meetings do you go to every single week? Why? Because church was a building where you attended a weekly event and programs. Now, our family moved here just over a year ago. And one of the fun things has been sharing our new home with friends and family from our old home. So we've had a lot of visitors over the last year from Indiana and some from Chicago. And invariably, when they visit, there comes a moment where they'll say, hey, I want to see this new church that you're a part of. Could we maybe do a quick tour? Now, what are they actually saying? Where do they want to go? To the building. Now, I really appreciate their interest in me and in my family. I do. I appreciate it. But when people say that, there's like a, a thunderclap inside my spirit. Because what I want to say is this. I know you're asking to go see the building, but if you want to meet my church, we can't go to the building. Because if we go to the building today, it's going to be mostly empty. There won't be any people there. So you'll get to see a building, but you won't get to see the church. If you want to see my church, I would love to introduce you to some amazing people. I'm in a fireside gathering on Sunday night, and the guys in there over the last year have become amazing friends to me. And we don't pretend. We're transparent. We tell the truth about our lives. And I would love for you to meet these guys. They're amazing. I have another group of guys. It's called Fowler's Made, and we meet on Tuesdays. And I'd love for you to meet Ty, and I'd love for you to meet Keith and, and Curtis and those guys. We have conversations that are so provocative. It's like soul food. We get together. It's like food for the soul. I'd love for you to meet them. Or I would invite you, come over to our house. We've got a tribe of course, it's my wife, Michelle, and my beautiful daughters, but it's, it's bigger than that. We have this extended family. Most of them are, are teenagers, and they eat a lot of my food. <laughs> but they're my church. They're my family, and I'd love to introduce you to them. And you know what this is? You can draw this picture on the right-hand side. This is a family that's on mission together, and we're learning to love Jesus, and we're learning to become like him, and we're sharing him together. I really want you to meet my church. You get what I'm saying? See, that's be the church. Because in the go to church paradigm, you know what? We say the church is a building. But ah, the church isn't a building. Have you ever played taboo? You say the wrong word. Ah, it, let me ask you, is the church a building? You tell me. Ah, no, no, no. Write this down. Comparison, right? The, the church is actually a body. In fact, let me give you the be the church paradigm. Write this down. Church is a body of people, and we are the family of God on an everyday mission. That's who we are. We're a body of people that have been bound together, and we are now a family 
that God is knit together in Jesus, and we are an everyday mission together. So the church isn't the building. The church is a body. It's my body. It's your body. We take the church with us wherever we go because in the deepest way possible, we are the church. And so it's not a building. It's a body. It's not something you just attend. It is something that we are because we are a family. My daughters don't say, hey, let's go to Wegner family. Anyone up? Let's go to Wegner family. It doesn't make any sense, right? They were inside their mama for nine months. Can I get an amen from the ladies? Because Wegner is something they are. And church is something that we are. It's not a building. It's not something we simply attend. Is church just an event? Uh, no. We already wrote it down. You know what it is? It's something we are every day. It's an everyday mission. It's the mission of Jesus. It includes every single area of life. And is the church programs? Uh, no. Fundamentally, the church, it's a people. It's the people of God, saved by the power of God for the purposes of God. You see, in the go-to-church paradigm, if you had to bottom line it, I mean, basically what we're saying is church is just something you do. It's an activity. But when Jesus said, I will build my church, let me ask you, do you think what he was really saying is, I have a master plan to change the world. I'm going to get into real estate. My plan to change the world is I'm going to get buildings everywhere. And then we'll use them a few hours a week. <laughs> and I'll pay a professional. And they'll run mediocre programs most of the time, if we're honest. Does that sound like the genius of Jesus? No, he's saying what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a body of people that are a family. Joined together 24 hours a day. Sharing my mission. Now, if you're feeling some tension right now, I get it. I'm one of the paid professionals. I feel it too. And what I'm not saying is this. Let's throw these out. See, the church isn't these things, but we have these things. I know personally, the last year for me has been so transformative and, and I'm a pastor. I'm helping to lead this thing. But I'm telling you, just as a member of this family, the, these services where we gather have been very catalytic in my life. I've been a part of programs at this church like Followers Made and Fireside that have been revolutionary for me. And our family has flourished because the church has these things. And I'm excited because you know what? Our church are utilizing these things not as the primal definition of who we are, but as tools in the hands of the people of God. And that's exciting. And over the next few weeks, as we move into the building, we just wanted to say again, the church ain't a building. Can I get an amen? Because right now, it's such an exciting time, and the new space is going to open up new opportunities, and new families are going to visit, and we want them to know that the church isn't a building. It's a family that you can be a part of. And here's the big idea for today. Write this down. Church is not an activity. Church is an identity. It's who we are. And he gives us buildings, and he gives us events, and he gives us programs, but they're just tools. We aren't those activities. We're an identity. And the New Testament is just full of these metaphors to help us understand our identity as the church. And we're going to look at one today. It's in Ephesians chapter 2. And here Paul takes three different metaphors and he weaves them together. He takes them like clay and he, he, he pushes them together. He's, he's doing layer upon layer of metaphor to try to unpack this huge identity that we have as the church. And it says this. So then you are no longer foreigners and non-citizens, but you are fellow citizens. Circle those two words. Here's the first metaphor. You're fellow citizens. With the saints and members of God's household. Members of God's household. Underline that. There's the second metaphor. Because you've been built on the foundation. You see, he shifted. He's gone to a new metaphor. Because you've been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole building. Underline that. The whole building, another metaphor, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you are being built together into a dwelling place 
of God in the spirit. Write this down. Being the church means being a citizen of the nation of God. Paul also says being the church means being a member of the family of God. And then Paul also says being the church means being a building block in the house of God. You hear Paul, he starts out with the metaphor of citizenship, and then he layers on, like a second layer of the cake, this idea of being a family, and then he layers on top of that this, this image of being a building, of being a house, of being a temple. And he's trying to push these all together into one cake so we begin to look and see how amazing it is to be the church. And he builds in this climax. He says it's like being the house of God. Now, we live in a time where we are fascinated with house projects, aren't we? Like redecorating, rebuilding, refreshing. It's the Pinteresting of our homes. It's the age of the man cave. And there's entire cable channels dedicated to do-it-yourself house projects. And we love the before and after stuff. It's really amazing to see the change. So I grabbed a few of these, okay? But here's a before. Look at that place. You push on that one corner post, the whole thing's going to go down, right? Look at this. Six months later, same house. Isn't that something? You look at that and go, man, I'd like to live there. Okay, here's another one. This is inside a house. Uh, there's that beautiful 1970s era kitchen with the, you know, with the fake brick backsplash. <laughs> That's classic. And that beautiful dark wood. There's after. Look at those tomatoes. Wow. Okay, here's another one before, all right? And then after, look how happy those people are. <laughs> Life is good at last in our new kitchen. Okay, there's before. Now, who thought of those wood toilets? You could get a splinter. I mean, that's nuts, okay? Look at after. Now there isn't even a toilet anymore. <laughs> I don't really know what to do in this room anymore. <laughs> before, after. And Paul is saying, you know what? Think of the coolest house you've ever seen. It's nothing compared to the house that God is building. And if you could see it the way I see it, you'd want to live there more than anything. And write this down. The order of the metaphors is designed to invite us into deepening levels of belonging. He's like saying, it's like, let me, I'm going to take you to another level. Let me take you to another level. Let me take you to another level. He starts and he says, okay, you're a citizen. That is a rich metaphor for belonging. Now we're going to take it to family. That's an even richer metaphor of belonging. And then he says, we're going to go to the very apex. You're like a building. And that's where for me it's like, well, you had me. Now you lost me. So we're going to have to unpack these to understand Paul's logic and why the house of God is for him the most meaningful image of belonging and identity. So let's start with the first one. He says this, again, his words are that we are no longer strangers and aliens, but citizens. We are citizens. You know, have you ever been to a country where you aren't a citizen on a trip? You feel awkward, right? You don't know the customs. You don't know the laws. If you feel out of place. You don't know the language. You're walking around going like, El, El Bano? Albania, all right? Michelle and I led uh, one of our first teams to Mexico. This was years and years ago, a mission trip with students. And we were going to do something like our kids get experience, a vacation Bible school. So I knew enough Espanol to be dangerous. So in advance, I translated the kids' worship songs into Spanish so we could be one up. We got there and we began to sing the first song. And it's that song, I have the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. And as we were singing this song, the kids just, they loved it. They were laughing. And, they, and so we sang it louder. We have the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? And they just kept laughing harder. We're like, this is awesome. It's a huge hit. And we got done. And the host came up and said, oh, you, who, who translated that song? I did. He said, you were not singing what you thought you were singing. <laughs> I said, what were we singing? He said, you were singing, I have the joy, 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 and I like to eat. And I like to eat. And I like to eat. 
And uh, I'm sure the kids are going, yes, gringo, we can tell you do, in fact, like to eat very much. <laughs> and it was very clear, we weren't citizens, huh? We were visitors. But when you're a citizen, you're at home, aren't you? And Paul says, you know what it means to be the church? You're a citizen. And there isn't a hidden caste system. There are no second-class citizens. Because of what Jesus did on the cross and because of his resurrection, you can be a citizen of the kingdom of God. Come one, come all, with all the rights of a citizen of the high king of heaven given to you. Paul says, is that good or what? Because God is building a house, and guess what he's building it out of? People bricks. And guess who the people bricks are? They're citizens of a new kingdom, and, and then he takes it to the next level. They're also family. As if being a citizen wasn't good enough, you're family. He says you're members of God's very household. And when you're family, that's even deeper, isn't it? One of my favorite stories from the Civil War era, it's an apocryphal story about Abraham Lincoln. And there was a soldier, a foot soldier, who fought in the Battle of Gettysburg, and he fought alongside his brothers and his father, all of which were killed in that battle. Imagine that loss. After the battle, he was given a furlough, and it struck him, a revelation. He realized his little sister and his mom, they would have no help for the spring planting. And he said, I cannot abide this. I need an exemption. I mean, I have to return home to take care of my, my little sister, my mom, and make sure the crops get planted. And so he literally, on his furlough, he went right to Washington, D.C. He was a, a simple country boy. He literally walked right up to the front gate, to the gatehouse, and said, I demand to see the President of the United States. And that soldier who was there looked at him and said, he saw his uniform, he said, you're a soldier, you need to get back to the battle lines, and literally threw him away from the gatehouse. And that little simple country boy went over and he sat down on this bench and began to think of his little sister and his mom and the loss of his father and his brothers, and he began to cry. And this little boy came up to him and said, Mr., what's wrong? And he told his story, just poured out of him, the tears and the words. And the little boy grabbed his hand and said, you come with me. And they walked up to that same gatehouse, and they walked right past it. They walked up to the front door of the White House, went right in, past generals, past senators. They walked right up to the door of the Oval Office, and that little boy opened up the door, and they walked right in, and there sat the very president of the United States, Abraham Lincoln, who looked up. He looked at the boy. He looked at the soldier. He looked back at the boy, and he said, Son, introduce me to your friend. That was Todd Lincoln. And that's exactly what Jesus has done for you. He's taken you by the hand, and he has walked you into the very presence of his Father, the living God. And he has made it possible for you to be adopted as a son or daughter. You're not just a citizen. You're a beloved son and daughter. And you know what? He is the president of the universe. He's running time and space. But you know what? More than that, he's your daddy. And this is your family. And what does it mean to be the church? That's about having our lives joined together by the blood of Jesus. Hey, guess what? We're blood relations in Jesus. That's, just, that's deep. <laughs> and Paul says, let me take it to another level. And he says, God is building a house of these people bricks, of these people who are citizens and family. And you know what he's reckoning back to? The image of the temple. The temple was for the Israelites the very pinpoint, the center of God's presence. Inside the temple, there was a holy of holies, and there was a massive veil that blocked entrance. And only one man, one time a year, would enter into the holy of holies where the presence of God was. And you know what? When he went in, they would have a rope tied around his leg, and he would have bells on because they were just assuming, you know what? You walk into the presence of God, you might just drop dead, and then we're going to drag your carcass out of there, you know? And when Jesus died and said, it is finished, the Scripture says that veil was torn in two. And it is an image to say, just like Todd Lincoln took that soldier in, guess where Jesus is taking you? To the Holy of Holies. 
into the very presence of God. And you know what? God doesn't make a temple out of, of bricks anymore. He's making a temple out of people. And you know what? We are the house of God. We are the temple of God. And you know why this is so rich and so deep? Because you know what? A king does not indwell its citizens, right? And guess what? Even a father doesn't indwell the son or the daughter. But you know what? In the house of God, God indwells his people. Church isn't just an individual identity. It's a communal identity. We are the house of God. And write this down. This is important to understand this image of being joined together. Why is this the deepest metaphor? Because the individual building blocks cannot find their meaning apart from the building. Building blocks apart from each other have no function at all. Think about that. Think about it. You know, we're in the middle of this building project, and, you know, months and months ago, Dan Chavrin and Jeff Manford, who've done a masterful job of leading us through this very complex process. I mean, this is a 21st century building we're putting together. It's thousands of parts. You go on a tour, and there'll be all these individual parts. There'll be bricks and pipes and wires. And, and every month as you do another tour, more and more of them would what? Be fit together. They would become one with the building. Because it's possible to be a, a building block in the building, but not to be a part of the building. Are you tracking with me? And what Paul is trying to help us get here is this. You know what? A citizen can have a falling out with the nation that he or she is a part of, right? And still be a citizen. A brother and sister can have a fight, and you're still a part of the family. You can have a falling out, right? But bricks in a wall, if the two bricks have a falling out, guess what? They're not a part of the wall anymore. And what he wants us to get is this. God is joining us together. And you and I cannot even really experience the reason we've been created until we are joined together in the house of God. Think about it. What's the purpose of all the building blocks being put together? It's to create a shelter, right? So when it's raining, you can go inside. Now, if it's just one brick, if all you got is your brick and you're trying to be the church by yourself, right? It's like trying to be a building with one brick. How's that going to go for you? If it starts raining, you can run around like this. It's not very effective. If it's the middle of the winter and there's a cold wind blowing over the Kansas plain, you can curl up with your brick. It's not going to get very warm. And this is you trying to be the church by yourself. And see, in the house of God, write this down. All the connected parts support each other. We become one. A house made of people bricks who are family and citizens of the kingdom of God. And you know what the deepest need in your life is? To have that kind of support. It's relational support and emotional support and intellectual support and spiritual support. And no one stands alone. And God's design for us is that we would be joined together, that we would truly do life together as a family on mission, treating each other as citizens, no second-class citizens. You know, I talked to you about my fireside group. I've been in that group for a year. And the backstory on fireside, if you haven't heard it, a few years ago was a group of guys around one fire. And now, four or five years later, there's three dozen groups, hundreds of guys meeting all over Kansas City. And you know what? I've been meeting these guys for a year. It's not because they're smart, really, trust me. <laughs> what's actually going on? This is what's going on. It's lives joined together. And the Bible talks about one anothering, that we ought to forgive one another, that we ought to bear each other's burdens, that we ought to confess our sins one to another. That yeah, we ought to love one another, encourage one another, welcome one another. And you know what? When ordinary people begin to take off the mask and live out these one another's and the spirit of God indwells them, they become like a house that everybody wants to live in. And it's like this rich community that's supernaturally empowered and people are drawn to it like a moth to the flame. And I'm telling you, over the last year while I've been in that group, we've launched three new groups, and I've literally seen marriages saved, families restored, 
addictions broken. And there are nights where we get to the end of the fire and I'm sitting there and I'm saying to myself, this is the house I want to live in. You see, write this down. Going to church, guess what? It can remain nameless. You know what? You, you can go to church and go to the building, attend an event and programs, and guess what? You can still remain hidden. Nameless. I want you to think about that for a moment. Is that kind of your experience? Because let me tell you something. When Westside Family Church gathers like this in our building, what we actually are is Westside Family Churches. We're a collection of all these little smaller communities these families that are living on mission together. And you know what? If you don't have that, you desperately need it. It's what it means to be the church. And see, write this down. Be the church is when we know each other's names. And I can can tell you the names of my church. I can walk through them one after another, after another, after another. And this big church becomes small when we begin to be a family on mission together, the house of God. And maybe you've been here and, and you've experienced kind of go to church and it's waking up your soul. And maybe you've been here a few weeks or maybe you've even been here a few years. And I want to ask you, as we, knew, as we move into this new building, don't let church remain nameless for you. And we've got an experience next week. It's called Get Connected. It's our way of making this big church small. 90% of the people that go through Get Connected end up getting involved in a small community of faith like this. Sometimes it's a serving team. Get this, 275 people last week stepped out and said, I want to be on a team of people that are serving together. I want to experience the family of God that way. If you're interested in that, you could come to Get Connected. And you know what? We're, this fall, we're launching, get this, 130 new groups. There's going to be space for everybody to have this big church be small and to be known. And if you're here and this church is still nameless, We want you to know as we move into this new building, there's nothing we will want more for you than to experience what it's like to live in the house of God. And in closing, we're going to pray together. And this is a very special prayer. It's a prayer offered by People Bricks and a house called Westside Family Church that is truly a miraculous house because it is a house that spans the nations where God is taking people from different nations and different tribes and different locations and he's making us one, members of his household. And so I want to ask as we watch this prayer that you would make it your own. This is the prayer of the people of God called Westside Family Church. Let's pray together. I just pray that you build your kingdom here and that you start in the heart of every person that walks in this room. Heavenly Father, you have provided this space for your people. And you long for all people to know you and worship you. I stand in this place before you. I just praise you already for for the space and what you're going to do here, Lord. Lord, it's just such an amazing thing that you're doing, and I'm so honored to be a part of it. And so, God, I pray that you will call middle school students here to love you, to become like you, and to share you with others. I am so excited for all the amazing families that are going to get to come here. That children would come to know that they were created by you, that they are loved by you, and that, Jesus, you want to be their friend forever. So we ask that you fill this place with worshipers. God, to fill this room, build your kingdom here. And Lord, I just pray that you fill this space. And that this place, Father, we pray you will fill it with people that will come and find a new identity in you as son and daughter of God. Jesus, as we stand here in this new space, not even finished, 
we are grateful. We ask you to fill this space, that you would fill Speedway, that you would fill Lansing. That you don't just fill every corner of the building with bodies, with stories, with people's souls, but you fill every corner of this space with your presence. We pray for all of this content that gets posted online. May they encounter you in such a profound way that the world will never be the same. And there are so many who need your rest. I just pray, God, that you would bring more and more people to come to know your rest. We just thank you for your greatness, for your awesomeness in this place. I ask that you would grow it, expand it by the power of your spirit. Fill the places where you've allowed us to work in South Africa, in India, in Thailand, and Laos. I know you have a good plan for all of us, especially in this place. Lord, fill this place with your people to expand your kingdom. We pray for every person that's going to walk in here this morning, Lord, that you would draw their heart to yours. Please fill this room with your presence, Lord God, and then just show up and do only what only you can do in this place, Lord God, uh, changing lives. Lord, fill this place with your people, Lord. Help us, Lord, to preach the gospel to the unreached in these areas. Help us do our part partnering with you as you fill these spaces. In Christ we pray. Amen. 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 God, we love you. Amen. Amen.